Growth at about 7% 7, 7 plus at this point in time. Inflation well under control. And once again, uh, the debate in a fairly public, uh, not debate as much as a demand from the finance ministry of the Reserve Bank to bring down interest rates. We now have moved to a monetary policy committee. There was one dissenting member of the monetary policy committee as the minutes show uh, last time around. But A, the manner in which the demand is being made for a rate cut, and B, uh, your, your own view on the possibility of, uh, of an aggressive rate cut at this point in time from the Reserve Bank? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, I, when you say demand being made, I, I don't treat that as a demand. I think the finance ministry has a lot of expertise and there's nothing wrong with the finance ministry sort of expressing its point of view. Uh, the Monetary Policy Committee can't just be expected to think uh, that it is the only repository of knowledge. So for the finance ministry to say, this is what we hope you will do is, I think, quite sensible. You know, you have to admit that when the inflation rate goes below 2%, now you could say, well, it's temporary, this, that, and the other. Uh, the, the situation is clearly one in which uh, the Monetary Policy Committee is very, is very likely, I think, to take a softer view than it mm. has been doing in the past. It sort of signaled that anyway earlier, but I don't want to sort of steal their thunder. You're going to know in a week. Let me say, I don't think, by the way, whether they drop the rate by 50 basis points or something like that is going to make such a huge mm. difference. Mm. Uh, because what's holding back the economy is not uh, the repo rate. Uh, there are other constraints. There's what's happening to private investment. There's the issue of NPAs in banks. All of those things uh, need to be fixed. Mm. But if you narrowed it down, I would find it very difficult to argue with the inflation rate where it is uh, that inflation is a problem. And I think the growth is not necessarily as robust as 7% because the last quarter wasn't 7%. Mm -hmm. So if you look at gross value added, uh, that is the old GDP at factor cost yeah. concept, it's actually below 7%. Mm. So the question is, uh, what do you think is normal? Mm. Uh, I can understand the finance ministry has been talking about 8%. So from their point of view, uh, you've got GDP much below potential, uh, the growth rate, and you've got an inflation rate which is very, very low. Since you were talking about one of the big constraints on growth being the fact that uh, banks continue to be saddled with a bad debt problem. Uh, now that we've moved the process of insolvency and bankruptcy, we've identified these 12 accounts which are now going to move towards the NCLT. Do you believe that this is now a decisive move towards finally bringing some kind of resolution, some closure uh, to this issue, moving towards closure to this issue? Well, certainly, I mean, moving towards closure, certainly. But, you know, I think the chair, chairman, the chairperson of the State Bank of India recently said that she doesn't think that this is going to instantly lead to mm. resolution. There are lots of difficulties that they'll have to come across, come through. But it's good that they've started. And if the first four or five move smoothly, it'll set a kind of standard for how subsequent cases will be treated. Mm. But you know, if these things are resolved and the banks take a huge haircut, which from all accounts they will have to, you will then be faced with the fact that these banks will be grossly undercapitalized. So the real question is, uh, what are you going to do mm. on recapitalizing the banks? Uh, are you in a position to actually privatize them mm. and sort of let, let the government share go below 51%? Mm. Um, if, if the government were willing to do that, that would be a very big signal, not necessarily to all banks, but to some banks. I don't think the government has actually said no. what their position is. So if they stay with what has been the traditional position, that is that we are not going to uh, let the thing go below 51%, yeah. you know, the ability of these banks to raise funds mm. within the 51% limit is not going to be all that mm. great because they're known to be weak. And the big question is, uh, what are the structural changes that we are making uh, which will prevent these banks from making the same, same mistakes? Mistake further on. You know, while and those are big issues. While privatization in the banking space is not being looked at, what is being looked at is consolidation. We're given to understand that perhaps by the end of August, we could see some announcement on the consolidation front. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts given where things are today of consolidating uh, three or see, four of these public yeah, sector banks? I've seen some of those comments also. I mean, you look, in my view, uh, if you take, uh, we don't really have any very strong banks, but if you take a strong bank and a weak bank and mix them, what you get is not a strong bank. You get something in between. 
So what is it that consolidation actually achieves? What consolidation achieves is that this mixed bank will be able to make bigger individual loans because its net worth will be larger. I don't regard that as a very important gain, quite honestly. Mm. In fact, there are serious problems when you merge banks. We look at the past because, you know, uh, a huge problem arises with the unions and how are you going to fit the staff of the weaker bank mm. into the scales of the stronger bank. And this was done in the 1990s when the uh, Punjab National Bank, I think, was mm. merged with the New Bank of India. Mm. And that merger problem really burdened them hugely. Mm. So I don't see what is gained by the consolidation, but maybe I've not, I mean, I've not seen a well thought out argument for it. Mm. One thing is very clear. See, if you're consolidating with a, with a stronger bank and getting rid of the top management of the weaker bank, that's different mm. because then you're injecting a new culture. Mm. But if the same management mm. and is, is just merged together, I don't see that it's going to make well, any we, difference. We don't, we don't know what the eventual plan will be, but consolidation uh, is likely uh, to be the order of the day. At least that's what we understand. But you know, one of the issues uh, that is gaining currency now is the privatization of Air India, the strategic disinvestment uh, of Air India. And again, uh, lots of options on the table being considered. Uh, what do you do with the debt? How much of a write-off will you need to take? Uh, do you sell the subsidiaries separately? Uh, what do you do with the land? How are you <laughs> reading? How are you reading the, well, look, the, the, uh, the proposed privatization I've been, plan? I've been in favor of the private. I mean, I had recommended it in a note which I had done in 1990. So uh, if it happens in the year 2017, that will be 37 years after I first recommended it in an internal government document. Mm. Okay. So wonderful. I mean, I think it's a good idea. Um, on the issue of uh, what do you do with its debt, I mean, look, it's quite clear that if you want to sell the, if you want to sell the airline and you want somebody to pay something positive for mm. it, you would have to drastically cut the debt, which really means take the burden of the loss on the, on the fisc itself. In other words, simply say that, look, this part of the debt the government will take mm. care of, now you bid for the mm. rest of the airline. Uh, that's really what will happen. I mean, the other way of doing it, of course, is not to write off the debt, but simply ask people to bid for a capital subsidy, which would actually be used to retire the debt. Hmm. What, what was the recommendation that you had made in 1990? No, no, in 1990... It was a very different period. They were probably not period. sitting with this kind of there debt the anyway. idea was, the idea was... And I mean, look, this is a real problem. Mind you, in 1990, this was when Mr. V.P. Singh was prime minister. Uh, this, was, this was a period when nothing had happened hmm. on public sector reform. Since then, we've done a little bit here and there. Mr. Vajpayee's government even privatized one or two mm -hmm. of them, but then those things became hugely controversial, controversial so everything yeah. has kind of mm. uh, got off the table. Uh, I do think we need to look seriously at public sector reform, mm. but you know, we, need a, we do need an appreciation on the part of the public and an awareness and a, around which a, a, a sort of a political consensus can be built. Mm. If it can be built by doing it in bits and pieces, that's fine. Mm. I mean, you know, we can do that. Mm. Since you're talking about public sector reforms uh, and we were talking about consolidation in the banking space, what we're now starting to see happen is consolidation in the oil and gas space. The first move has been made with ONGC picking up a 51% stake in HPCL uh, and more is on the anvil. What do you make of that? Well, you know, isn't that just a way of using some of the surpluses in the public sector to give money to the government? I mean, I don't, I personally, I'm not a great uh, believer that the consolidation in the oil and gas space is actually going to produce a better structured industry. Mm. Uh, obviously, if uh, surplus companies buy up equity mm. in another company, that money goes to the government from whom they're buying it up. So it, sort of a bit of a support for the budget and that's fine I mean if that's the way you want to do disinvestment mm. it's really like disinvesting one public sector company, company to, another to another public sector yeah. company but the two together will have less money to invest mm. because one of them has given its money to the to the government mm. 
So I'm not a great fan of that, you know. However, these things do happen, and let's see, let's see what the logic of it is. So let me end then by asking you, Arvind Subramaniam uh, uh, made a comment about whether economists should be plumbers, dentists, sanitation workers, or Uber men, and you, 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 uh, you said that they should play the part of sanitation workers to, to flush out the bad ideas. No, no, I, didn't, I said all of the above, but... but. <laughs> I mean, Thar Tharman Shanmugaratnam, who's a very wise and really bright person, he kind of emphasized yes. the being the Uber men. Uber not in a taxi sense. The, yes, Uber, but, yes, just to clarify know, the grand, that, yes. The grand <laughs> strategist. And then he sort of said engineers, hmm. and then he said plumbers. But he didn't mention anything about the sanitary uh, guys. And I said flushing out bad ideas so is if, very, if there were, very if important. So if there was one bad idea that you would like to flush out uh, in 2017, what would it be? Uh, farm loan waivers. Farm loan waivers. In 2017, certainly. OK. And uh, if I were to add, give you the option for two bad ideas? No, then I need to think a little bit. You know, <laughs> there are huge numbers of bad ideas all the time. And, you know, at some point... Okay, the I, good idea. Oh, a good idea. Well, I would say a really good idea, uh, one, is to make a firm decision that we are, uh, we are going to present to the GST Council mm. a shift to a three-rate structure. Mm. Uh, I don't expect the government to actually implement it, but all that the GST Council needs is a proposal that we will set up uh, an independent group that will come to the GST mm. Council with a proposal. Second good idea, again, in the context of fiscal uh, federalism and so on, I think the GST Council should have an independent secretariat. You know, at the moment, the GST Council is, of course, serviced by mm. the Finance Ministry, uh, the Revenue Department. There's no doubt that they have some very, very good experts. Mm. But, you know, if you're talking about cooperative federalism, mm. Uh, experts within the government is one thing, but yeah. we're now moving in a world where the real expertise yeah. is not within government. Mm. Tax lawyers are important, mm. chartered accountants are important, consulting companies are important. I think we should have an independent secretariat to the GST Council, headed by a person of the rank of secretary, mm. who would report to the chairman of the GST mm. Council, which is the finance minister. minister. But they would actually do two things. One is come up with new ideas. Mm. And also, when the finance ministry itself wants to move an idea, uh, the G this council should give its opinion on these ideas. Mm. Because between the finance ministry and the state's finance ministries, this highly, I mean, the human capacity level yeah. is obviously quite different. So I think if you want good quality GST council work, Get yourself a first-class secretary, not a huge one, yeah. a top-class one, but which brings in as consultants the world, India's best people, but more than that, I would say the world's best people. Because, you know, as an open economy, yeah. we need to move towards a tax structure that is also aligned with what is happening elsewhere. elsewhere. And that's the only way it's going to happen. Mantik Singhalwali, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate your time. Thank you.